rest of her life, Penelope was considered a medical mystery. It started when she was 23, and she developed a high fever, 102, and severe abdominal pain. She had to be rushed to the hospital. Her legs were too weak to hold her up. Her heart was racing, her blood pressure was sky high. Appendicitis predicted the surgeons as they hurried her to the operating room. But the appendix they took out was completely normal. And after the surgery, she got even worse. Slowly, she got better. And after a week, she was well enough to go home. But no one could really explain to her what made her so sick or, or even why she got better. And it happened again and again and again for the next 25 years. She had 13 operations. Has her doctors struggled to figure out what was wrong with her? Everything she could live without was taken out. Her gallbladder, her ovaries, her uterus. By the time she was 48 years old, Penelope had seen dozens of doctors. Finally, one was able to tell her what she had. He recognized a pattern of her symptoms. He'd seen it before. He asked her, have you ever heard of acute intermittent porphyria? Well, of course she hadn't. Porphyria is a rare inherited disorder of the nervous system where all the nerves in the body are attacked by a waste product that these bodies can't get rid of. It can be treated. The episodes can be prevented. But first, you have to have the right diagnosis. So porphyria is just one of 7,000 rare diseases that we now know of. More are identified every year. Some 30 million Americans have these rare diseases. And like Penelope, many of them have trouble finding out what's making them so sick. Average time to diagnosis, six years. So why does it take so long? Why do doctors have such trouble identifying diseases that affect one in 10 Americans? Well, if it makes you feel any better, we're not just missing the rare ones. <laughs> when a patient goes to see a doctor, it's usually with what he considers a simple question, what's wrong with me? And before I started medical school, I thought the answer to that question was also simple, like the multiplication tables. Four times six is always 24, so a fever and a rash would always be the same predictable entity. But of course, that's not the case, not even close. A fever and a rash could have dozens of causes. Be a viral infection like the measles or the chicken pox. It could indicate a severe allergic reaction. It could be the first signs of a hidden cancer. You see, diagnosis, it's not math. It's Sherlock Holmes. Now, I'm going to explain to you what I mean by that. But first, let me take on the math. So when a doctor hears this simple question, his mind goes straight to the most common, the most likely diagnosis. And most of the time, he'll be right, because most people have the most common diagnosis. The mind wants to go to the simplest answer, and experience tells us that that's often right. So going with that first answer, it's not lazy, it's learned. And research backs us up on this. A recent study showed that Going with that first answer will be right 95% of the time. So 95%, that's pretty good. But that does mean that 5% of the time, we're going to be wrong. And if you do the math on that, that turns into 12 million Penelope's every year. Or how about this number? 90,000 people die in the hospital every year because of missed or wrong diagnoses. That's more people than were killed in the opioid epidemic at its peak. That's twice as many people as are killed in car accidents every year. The National Academy of Medicine published a report on diagnostic error in 2015. They bring it even closer to home. Their report opens with the line that most of us will be the subject of at least 
one diagnostic error in our lifetime, and sometimes those errors will have catastrophic results. It's a problem for us all. So what's to be done? I propose three common sense remedies, which, if adopted and accepted by the medical community, could dramatically reduce our risk of diagnostic error. They are more training, more feedback, more specialization. So it's crucial that doctors get more and better training in diagnosis. And having gotten all this training, it sure would be great if we could get some feedback. It's feedback that tells a doctor what he got right and where he went wrong. Finally, and this is going to be most important for the Penelopes of the world, those with rare diseases, creating a new specialty devoted to diagnosis is essential. So can we improve training? It's a challenge. I mean, it practically takes an act of Congress to change medical school curriculum, and you know how hard that is. And yet there's no single intervention that would do more to improve uh, our rate of diagnostic error than improving how we teach doctors to make a diagnosis. I said earlier that diagnosis was Sherlock Holmes. That's not just a metaphor. You see, Arthur Conan Doyle, he was himself a physician. And he created the character of Holmes based on his uh, mentor, Dr. Joseph Bell, a surgeon who was renowned through all of Great Britain for his great observational and deductive abilities. So it's not surprising that doctors can learn from these Holmesian skills, because that's where they came from, from medicine itself. OK, you might ask, what can doctors actually learn from Sherlock Holmes? Well, first, Sherlock Holmes always kept an open mind as he considered all of the evidence before he made a diagnosis or actually solved a crime. It is, Holmes told Watson, it is a capital mistake to theorize before collecting all the evidence. It biases the judgment. But then, having collected all the evidence, the impulse to go with that first answer is almost overwhelming. We see a pattern in the, in the symptoms and snap. We make a decision. Researchers who study decision-making call that satisficing. It's a combination word combining satisfying with suffice, satisficing. It's a good enough answer. But in medicine, a good enough answer is simply not good enough. We need to fight our intuition and force our minds to stay open long enough for us to ask that question that all doctors must ask. What else could this be? Well, that's straight out of Sherlock Holmes. The consulting detective was famous for considering all the evidence and looking at everything before he made a decision. That's why he's so often depicted with a magnifying glass in his hand to indicate that he looked more closely at what seemed obvious to others to see what hadn't been seen, what hadn't been considered. Only then, said Holmes, can you balance the probability and choose the most likely. That, says Holmes, is the scientific use of the imagination. Well, that's what great diagnosticians do as well. So you see, it's not a superhuman feat. It's not something that only fictional characters can do. It's a skill that can be taught. And the sooner we start teaching our doctors to make diagnoses using these Holmesian skills, the sooner we'll see our rate of diagnostic error improve. A second step we can take to improve diagnosis is to integrate more feedback loops into our clinical settings. When a patient goes to see a doctor with a complaint, that doctor's going to take a history, do an exam, maybe send off a test or two, but ultimately, he's going to make a diagnosis and come up with a treatment plan. And then he's going to send the patient home. And if that patient doesn't come back, that doctor is going to think, I nailed it, I got it right, and the patient got better. But actually, there are other possibilities. We need more feedback loops so that doctors actually know when they get it right or when the patient suffered from 
one of those other possibilities. This is already starting to happen a little bit, and in some really exciting ways. For example, one of the busiest emergency departments in New York City gives its ED doctors notification whenever a patient they see and send home comes back to the hospital within 72 hours. That's useful feedback. Surgical robots can teach novice doctors, novice surgeons, how to improve by showing them exactly what more experienced surgeons do. That's useful feedback, too. There's a smartwatch app that gives immediate feedback to people doing chest compressions on their speed and depth. That's important feedback. The point is, all of these are ways for doctors to see for themselves how they're doing, what's working, what isn't. We need more. The more feedback loops we can integrate into medicine, the more opportunities doctors have to learn from their mistakes and do better. Both of these steps are going to be important for most of doctors' diagnostic decisions. But they're not going to help the Penelopes of the world, those with rare diseases. Here's what we know about difficult diagnoses. The doctor most likely to make that diagnosis is not the youngest doctor with the most recent education or the oldest doctor who's been around the longest or the doctor who went to the best school or had the best training. The doctor most likely to make a difficult diagnosis is the doctor who's seen it before. I propose that we create a specialty in diagnosis so that we can teach doctors to be Dr. House, so that when they see these rarities, they'll recognize them because they will have seen them before or because they will have learned about them in detail. That's how Sherlock Holmes did it. Holmes Watson was amazed by Holmes' extraordinary knowledge of crime. Says Watson, Holmes seemed to know every detail of every horror perpetrated in the century. And then Holmes would take that encyclopedic knowledge and use it to see patterns in his current crimes. Now, I don't know how useful that kind of knowledge actually is in crime fighting, but in medicine, in diagnosis, that kind of detailed and intimate knowledge of a disease, it's everything. And Holmes wasn't only interested in the crimes. He was fascinated by the clues as well. He wrote an entire monograph on cigar ash. So doctors need to be as interested in the clues that help them make the diagnosis as Sherlock Holmes was and pay the same kind of attention to detail that Holmes did. That's going to help them make a diagnosis. It used to be that doctors like me, specialists in internal medicine, we were the ones that other doctors came to when they had tough cases. That was our area of expertise. That's not so true anymore. We have a new job. The internist now is the go-to guy for the diagnosis and treatment of the real killers of Americans, chronic diseases. That's diseases like high blood pressure or diabetes or high cholesterol. It's internists who routinely manage heart disease, lung disease, diseases of the GI tract. We make sure our patients get their routine cancer screening and their annual flu shots. It's an important job and will save the most lives. And there's new research coming out every day in more and better ways to manage these everyday killers. And yet, we still need someone to take on the toughest cases. So I propose that we create a specialty just for that that we teach doctors, show doctors what these entities look like so that when these specialists encounter the complex and unusual pattern of these diseases, they'll recognize them. They'll be able to make a diagnosis sooner, reduce suffering faster, and save lives. Diagnosis is the most important part of what a doctor does. It's only when we have the right diagnosis 
that the appropriate treatment can be started. It's only when doctor and patient know the diagnosis that they can peer into the future and see what lies ahead. Training, feedback, specialization, these are basic management tools, tools that are valued throughout all of business and government and athletics and countless other fields. We need them in medicine, too. It's time for everyone in medicine to get better at diagnosis. Our patients' lives depend on it. Thank you.